The electron machines like the Syntact, Digitact or Digitone are incredibly well thought out electronic instruments. However, some features are sorely missing, and if you don't want to go crazy while working with these boxes, you seriously need to know a few essential tricks and workarounds. While we demonstrate these workarounds on the Syntact, a lot of what you see here is also directly applicable to the Digitact as well as the Digitone. And if you want all of this on one handy printable overview, we've updated our Syntact and Digitact cheat sheets to include all of the workarounds from this video. Download them now from our Patreon. So, let's dive straight into it. Hello everyone, this is... As we mentioned in our Syntact review, a big problem with the Syntact, Digitact and Digitone is that they don't have kits. Let's say we have created a series of patterns, all made with the same sounds. If I now decide that I'd rather have a different kick, a slightly shorter hi-hat decay, and maybe different reverb settings, then these changes only affect the current pattern. The other patterns all still have the old sounds. Of course you can copy the sound settings from one single track, the bass drum for example, switch to a different pattern and paste the sound settings there. But that was only the sound of one single track. Worst case is you have to do this 12 times for each track and again for the effect settings. And then you've only updated one single pattern. No thank you. Here's what you have to do instead. Step 1. Save the project. Very important. You do know about that shortcut function and gear wheel, right? Step 2. Copy the pattern with the new sounds onto all patterns with the old sounds. Yes, you're overwriting all your precious patterns right now and it feels very wrong, but that's part of the plan. Remember that you can also bulk paste a pattern onto multiple slots. Now you're even faster at wreaking havoc. Step 3. For each of these destroyed patterns, you now need to go into the pattern menu, the button with the three tiny steps, and say you want to reload the sequence data from the project. Remember when you saved the project in step 1? Now you're reloading just the sequence data from that save state. This means the new sounds are still there, but you've reloaded all the steps and automation from the moment you saved the project. Repeat this for every pattern. Ta-da! Now every pattern has the new sounds. When a drum machine offers you open and closed hi-hats, these usually choke each other. Meaning, if you play a closed hat while an open hat is still ringing, this will silence or choke the open hat. Makes absolute sense. This is how a real hi-hat behaves. But here we have no choke groups. We can't tell one track to silence another when it plays. The only way to achieve this effect is to put both the open and closed hi-hat sounds on one single track. To do this, we'll use a feature called Sound Locks. First, choose one of the two hi-hat sounds, preferably the one that's used less often, in this case the open hat. Now you have to go into the Sound Manager, press left arrow to access the project's local sound pool, and on any of these 128 slots, you can press right arrow, and select Save to here. Give it a meaningful name and add some tags if you want to. This sound can now be sound locked onto single steps because it's in this sound pool. Don't confuse the sound pool with the global presets. Global presets are available whenever you browse sounds for a track. This is a separate preset area that belongs only to this project. So now we can clear the open hat track. We don't need it anymore. Back in the closed hat track, we can hold any step, turn the level data knob, and select a sound from the sound pool. We've now turned this closed hat into an open hat. Remember that you can also copy and paste single steps, which makes placing the open hats a bit more comfortable. Because the tracks are monophonic, they can only play one sound at a time. This automatically makes the two sounds choke each other. The downside is that you can't actually see which steps have sound locks on them. It would be so helpful if sound locks had a different color, like this. Oh, 
Only the Digitone has Portamento, which allows you to slide a note from one pitch to another. But as with all Electron machines, it's good practice to go through the factory presets and listen for interesting things, and then analyze how the sound designers did it. In the Syntact, Bank A pattern 3 caught my attention. That pattern is called Silver State, and it contains a 303-like bassline with note slides, even though the Syntact doesn't support those. So, how does that work then? Well, it's made possible by using an LFO. This LFO is pre-configured, so it bends the pitch as soon as it is triggered. The depth parameter controls in which direction the bend goes and how strong it will be. You can then parameter lock this everywhere you need bends. But there is a problem. You'll hear it when I hold a note. It won't stop bending back and forth. In this pattern, that's not a problem. You don't hear it because the notes aren't held for very long. But when we did our cover of Aphex Twin's T69 Collapse for our Syntact review, we needed a solution that also works on less busy patterns, on bass lines with longer notes. So, building on this idea from the factory preset, I experimented some more and here's what I came up with. Let me show you from scratch how I did it. You can use any synth sound for this, analog or digital. In this case I'll use a raw digital oscillator so you can clearly hear what's going on. Step 1. You need to sacrifice one of the track's LFOs to the Portamento guards. I'll take LFO 1. Step 2. Set the LFO destination to the main tune or pitch parameter of the synth machine. We don't hear anything yet because the LFO depth is still at zero. So let's turn that up. Now something's happening. The LFO is clearly changing the pitch, but we're always catching the LFO at a different time in its cycle because the LFO is running free. If you select an LFO mode with one of these little arrows on the icon, this means the LFO will reset each time a note is triggered. Now the LFO will always reliably start from the same point. Let's increase the speed multiplier a bit, so the bending happens faster. While this LFO mode does reset, it also keeps on going forever. That's not what we want. We want a single bend, and we want the note to stay there without going back. There are two other LFO modes that will also reset. One and half. But as you can hear, they both go back to the original pitch once they're done, and that's where the LFO waveform comes into play. Step 3. Set the LFO waveform to exponential, the LFO mode to 1, and the LFO speed to a negative value. About minus 50 will do. This combination gives you a single bend that stays at the target pitch. And what's really awesome, the LFO depth is equivalent to semitones. If I set the depth to plus 1, it will bend up a half step. At minus 12, it will bend down one octave. And so on. But let's set this back to zero so the notes don't bend by default. And all we need to do now is parameter lock the LFO depth onto any steps where we want the bends to be. But you don't have to place the bends directly on the beginning of the note. You can also add these yellow lock tricks, which you can even micro-time. And parameter lock the LFO depth on there. This lets you create bends anywhere, not just at the start of a note. Step 4. You can now fine-tune the bend time with the LFO speed, speed multiplier and start phase. For T69 Collapse, we used a speed multiplier of 128 and a phase of 75, but you will always need to adjust that so it fits your song. If you need different bend speeds on some steps, you can of course just parameter lock that onto the steps. Don't forget that you can hold a step and press yes to preview it. This way, you don't have to wait for the sequencer to pass it by. I 
hope you still have an LFO left, because of course we're going to need another one for vibrato. This is much more simple than the portamento workaround. You can use a regular sine or triangle wave to modulate the synth machine's tune parameter. And then adjust the LFO depth and the speed parameters to taste. Of course you could now again lock the LFO intensity onto selected steps, but I feel we've already done enough manual labor for one day, so we let the fade parameter do all the work. With this, we can fade in the LFO depth. It will start at zero, and then gradually increase. This gives us kind of an auto vibrato that sets in shortly after the note is played. Notice how it only happens on the longer notes, but the shorter ones are left untouched. Here's a quick one. The syntact, digitact and digitone don't have accents. You have to program note velocities, which can be a bit tedious. There's no way to quickly assign a certain velocity to a step. But at least you can copy and paste a step, which will also copy its velocity. For instance, if I make this an unaccented step by giving it a velocity of 50, I can now copy that step and paste it everywhere I need it. And don't forget that you can always hold multiple steps at once and adjust their velocities together. Here's how to get pulse width modulation on the Syntax Digital Bits engine. Let's take a closer look at its waveform parameter. It starts as a sine, morphs into a triangle, and then into a sawtooth. At 64, the waveform turns into a square, and as we go up towards the maximum from there, the only thing that changes is the pulse width of the square wave. So, we want the LFO to oscillate between these two states, a square at 64 and a square with a long pulse width at 127. That's why we have to set the waveform parameter right in the middle of those two values, which would be 95.5, but let's round up to 96. Coincidentally, that's one of the values you can jump to by holding function while turning the encoder. How convenient! And now we want the LFO to modulate this synthesizer waveform value by 32. This means, at its extremes, the LFO brings the synthesizer waveform parameter down to 64, a square, and up to 127, a square with maximum pulse width. And it will keep oscillating between those two states, giving us pulse width modulation in the process. Adjust the speed to taste. If you don't want the pulse width modulation to be that extreme, just pick a smaller distance from 64 on the waveform. Let's say 20 away from 64, so 84. Then give that same distance value of 20 to the LFO depth. Now it modulates 20 up to 104 and 20 back down to 64, the square wave. Let's add some delay and reverb and experiment with the LFO speed. While the Digitone has an arpeggiator, the Syntact and Digitact don't. There is a workaround though, and of course it involves an LFO. This is the sound we'll be working with. Again we want to target the pitch or tune parameter. Let's set the depth to 12 for an octave. But now we hear all those in-between values. An arpeggiator is supposed to jump to clearly defined note pitches. That's why we need to set the LFO waveform to square. This gives us two states. First, the LFO adds the depth value. Then it subtracts it. At a depth of 12, that's one octave up and one octave down. And we want this to reliably start the same way every time we play a note. So the LFO can't run free, it needs to reset every time. Right now the LFO starts with the upper octave and then goes down. I want it to be the other way around, 
low octave first. So I'll shift the start phase to 64. If you want more attack or bite on the arpeggio, you can shift the phase a tiny bit back again, so there's a millisecond of that upper octave coming through. It's like an added transient. Now adjust the LFO timing until it sounds right. However limited this may be, it's enough for some old-school 8-bit arpeggios, and that makes me very happy. You could make the arpeggios more complex by adding a second LFO that takes the pitch to yet another interval and then offset the start phase so the two LFOs each take turns shifting the pitch. There's no compressor on the Syntact, but with the tools we have in here, we can easily imitate the effect of a side-chained compressor. We need two things. First, we need a way to group some tracks together. Second, we need to apply a volume curve to that group of tracks to achieve that characteristic pumping sound. The Syntact has this analog effects block. Here you can decide which tracks go into it. Since this is basically a bus, the first requirement is already met. We can use this to group our tracks together. Let's route everything into here, except the kick. In fact, let's mute the kick so we can focus on the other instruments. The analog effects block has an amplitude envelope. And that's just what we need to repeatedly dip the volume down, just like a sidechain compressor would. But you can change these settings all you want. Nothing will happen. That's because the effects track has its own sequencer lane. Only if the sequencer finds a step here, this will trigger the amp envelope. Let's do a quick 4 on the floor that mimics the kick. And that's the big downside. This doesn't actually listen to the kick, you have to explicitly tell it where to duck down. You can hear that each of these steps now triggers this amp envelope. So let's unmute the kick and fine tune the amp envelope so everything fits together. Let's hear it again, with and without the fake side chaining. So, what have we learned today? LFOs are super useful, and Electron should put like 2 or 3 or 10 more of these on each track. Because, let's face it, everyone needs pulse with modulated multi-level arpeggios with vibrato and portamento. A big shout out to everyone supporting us on Patreon. Thanks to you, we can keep making these videos. And leave us a comment with your favorite video game melodies from your childhood. Here's one of mine.